科技临界点，向世界介绍中国科技。Hi, I'm Lisa, and this is Threshold in China. Today, we are going to share some exciting tech innovations and announcements that happened in China recently. On December 14, 2013, China left its mark on lunar history when the Chang'e 3 probe achieved a successful soft landing on the moon's surface. This marked the beginning of a detailed survey of this mysterious celestial body and made China the third country to have the technology for extraterrestrial soft landing and rover exploration. The landing site was later named Guanghan Palace, also known as the Moon Palace, which is the legendary home of the Chinese moon goddess and Yutu, China's first lunar rover. Its mission was to study the moon's surface, bridging the gap between ancient lore and modern science. The Chang'e 3 ladder and Yutu rover even snapped a selfie together against the breathtaking moonscape. Throughout its operation, U2 faced extreme challenges, enduring temperature fluctuations, and overcoming damage. But it pushed through, analyzing lunar geology, creating the very first geological profile of the moon's subsurface, and capturing close-up photographs. U2's instruments revealed surprising insights, including a lunar regolith and a more diverse subsurface structure than expected. It traveled about 114 meters on the moon's surface, even though it was designed to last only three months. Yu Tu persevered for a remarkable 972 days before finally powering down. But that wasn't the end of the story. Fast forward to 2019, and Chang'e 4 accomplished something unprecedented. It landed on the far side of the moon with the Yu Tu 2 rover. This mission brought us groundbreaking discoveries, including lunar mantle material, which is crucial for understanding the moon's formation and evolution. It sent back valuable data on lunar soil composition and space environment. By studying how the rover's wheels interacted with the surface, researchers found that the mechanical properties of the lunar soil in the landing region resembled a dry sand and sandy soil. With even better load-bearing characteristic than the moon soil samples from the Apollo era, and U2 too is still operating today, making it the longest working lunar rover, cruising around the moon covering nearly 1,500 meters. In 2020, Chang'e 5 brought back the first lunar samples in over four decades. These samples, weighing 1,731 grams, include basalt and dust. They will play a crucial role in helping us determine the moon's precise age and formation history. But the journey of U2 doesn't stop there. There are missions like Chang'e 6, 7, and 8 on the horizon, carrying the ambition of manned lunar exploration. China is preparing for lunar landings using its new heavy lift Long March 9 rocket and planning complex sample return missions from Mars around 2030. Let's continue witnessing this epic cosmic romance together as we explore the moon, Mars, and beyond. For years, a law called the Wolf Amendment had severely restricted collaboration between America's NASA and China's CNSA. But NASA just made a surprising move. They're actually urging their researchers to apply for samples from China's moon mission, specifically the Chang'e 5 mission that happened in 2020. This year, on October the 1st, China announced that they are accepting research proposals from international scientists to apply for the Chang'e 5 lunar sample. It's the first time they've done this, and scientists are excited. James Head. A planetary scientist at Brown University says there has been great enthusiasm internationally to study the samples. NASA recognized the unique value of these specimens and has allowed their researchers to submit requests during China's last application round. They're calling it an exception to bilateral restrictions and wants to ensure the equal research opportunities as foreign institutions. Even though there are still policy hurdles, Dr. Head is hopeful that 
This could be the start of an era of various levels of coordination, cooperation and collaboration. But there's more! China plans to launch Chang'e 6 by 2024 and collect the first ever sample from the far side of the moon. According to NASA's email, studying these could be even more enlightening. They could go to the south pole of the moon where the resources are. And they could land and they would say, this is our exclusive territory, you stay out. Meanwhile, Chinese and American space agencies are also working on separate missions to collect and bring back samples from Mars, which could happen around 2030. However, an independent review that came out in September showed that NASA's budget and timeline for their Mars program are unrealistic and challenges remain. But on the whole, while geopolitics may constrain collaboration, for now, the future of space science is very promising. On the 6th of December, China's Shidao, one high-temperature gas-cooled nuclear power plant, completed 168 hours of continuous operation tests, and it was officially put into commercial use. This marks China as the world's first country to achieve commercial operation of a fourth-generation nuclear power plant. How is the fourth generation different to the previous generations? Well, generally speaking, nuclear power plants generate electricity using the heat released from the nuclear fission reactions. In conventional reactors, this heat is transferred by coolant loops to heat steam, which spins turbines connected to the electric generators. The first three generations of reactors are primarily water-cooled, with ordinary or pressurized light water serving as coolant and neutral moderator. Pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors have both been the backbone of nuclear power since the mid-20th century. But water cooling brings some challenges as overheating could lead to steam explosion within the reactor. It also faces other issues like nuclear waste, limited fuel efficiency and safety concerns around meltdowns. The Fukushima disaster in Japan, for example, triggered a massive earthquake and tsunami in 2011 and raised global concerns over nuclear safety. Unlike its predecessors, the fourth generation reactor is designed with inherent safety features and greater efficiency. For instance, the Shidao reactor is a high temperature gas cooled reactor and it uses helium gas instead of water for cooling. This deals with the risk of steam explosion and also allows for higher operational temperatures, which increases efficiency. This enables industry applications like clean hydrogen production and higher electrical efficiency around 50% as compared to the 33% for conventional light water reactors. Another advantage of the fourth generation reactor is its inherent safety. And joint developer Tsinghua University emphasizes that in the event of a sudden reactor failure or external disturbance, the core will not melt. For instance, its specialty fuel spheres can withstand over 1,650 degrees Celsius without releasing radioactivity. Even in an extreme accident, the temperature inside the reactor is unlikely to reach this temperature. The Shidaowen plant in Shandong province is the result of joint research and development by China Huaneng Group, Tsinghua University, China National Nuclear Corporation and other institutions. With over 90% domestically manufactured equipment, construction began in December 2012. Grid connection was achieved in December 2021. And now this is the final milestone enabling full power commercial operation. Imagine being able to make a phone call and access the internet from anywhere in the world using satellite in space. Well, this summer, Huawei, the tech giant, has launched the world's first ever smartphone with satellite connectivity, and it's achieved with the help from China's high-orbit communication networks. China announced the completion of the first high-orbit satellite internet system, positioning itself as a potential competitor to SpaceX Starlink. This network consists of three satellites orbiting over 20,000 miles above Earth, giving them a very wide coverage area. 
It will provide internet connectivity for industries like aviation, shipping, and emergency services across China and even parts of Southeast Asia, India, and even Russia. Now, let's compare it with Elon Musk's Starlink network. Starlink uses over 50,000 small, low-orbit satellites that are only a few hundred miles up. These satellites offer faster speed but cover smaller areas, whereas China's high-orbit satellites cover a much broader area. Given their high fixed position relative to the Earth, fewer satellites are required to achieve comprehensive coverage. On the other hand, Starlink's low-orbit satellites provide high-speed communication and low transmission delay. They are more resilient to disruptions if one satellite fails. In contrast, the failure of a high-orbit satellite could have a significant impact on the entire network. According to Professor Sun Yaohua, who studies satellite engineering, both high- and low-orbit satellite networks will be important in the future. It's like the difference between cell towers and Wi-Fi. High orbits for widespread coverage and low orbits for targeted enhancement. So what's next? Professor Sun predicts that China will invest more in low-orbit communication networks to power future 6G technology and compete with Starlink globally. This high-orbit network is expected to facilitate communication for people in Belt and Road countries and also provide a valuable experience in maintaining and operating satellite systems, which is crucial for China's future satellite internet development. And that is all for today's Threshold. We hope you like this new section on science and technology in China. As usual, we welcome your feedback and thoughts.